Thank you, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. I am standing between you and your cup of coffee, so I'm going to try to keep this short. I hope to leave you with three points. We have a problem. But the first point is that the root of this problem is misaligned commercial interests. The reason companies burn forests and engage in unsustainable degradation of our land is because of short-term profits. The second point, the main victims of this, in fact, are the local indigenous people living on and adjacent those lands that are subject to such environmental vandalism. The third point is that there is therefore an urgent need for governments, for non-government organisations and for local communities to insist on transparency, to collaborate more effectively, to pursue investigations and to prosecute those responsible. So those are the three points I wanted you to remember. The rest of my speech you can accept and take at face value. We are here today, as I said, and because we have a problem. And there are three key reasons why this problem matters. First, the loss of biodiversity. Second, the huge emission of greenhouse gases. And third, the negative and real impact that these practices have on our local communities. The forests of Southeast Asia make up about 5% of the world's total. But I think many people don't appre sufficiently appreciate the fact that there is greater biodiversity in the forests of Southeast Asia than there is in even the Amazon or in the African rainforest. And there's certainly greater biodiversity, even in a tiny spot like Singapore, than the entire continental United States. So the point is, if we mismanage the rainforest in our neighbourhood, this is a loss not just for us, but indeed for the entire world. But we know, unfortunately, that Southeast Asia is losing rainforests at an unprecedented rate. A 2013 publication in the journal Science revealed that the amount of forests lost globally from 2000 to 2012 is approximately 2.3 million square kilometers. To put this in context, this is about 3,100 times the size of Jakarta, or indeed 1.2 times that of the entire Indonesian. The forests in Southeast Asia are not spared from this worrying development, and it is basically being driven by economic interests. Logging, Pulpwood clear-cutting clear have also led to extensive deforestation. But it's not just the loss of biodiversity, but also the impact on global climate change. Deforestation contributes at an alarming rate to the emission of greenhouse gases. In fact, a 2010 REDD report suggests that the majority of Indonesia's greenhouse gas emissions actually stems from land use activities. 37% of it due to deforestation and 27% due to peat fires. In fact, deforestation occurring on peatlands, especially peatlands that have been cleared by burning, releases a disproportionate amount of carbon dioxide. I saw a recent study, in fact, this was research conducted by C4, and it estimated that in June last year, when we experienced the worst episode of haze so far in Southeast Asia, 
In June last year, the estimate is that about, let me get the figures correct, about 171 megatons of carbon dioxide equivalents of greenhouse gases were emitted. To put that 171 megatons in context, that represents about 10% of Indonesia's reported annual greenhouse gas emissions for the period from 2000 to 2005. So it's ironic that we spend, and I'm on the climate change circuit, all of us negotiators have a very big footprint because we jet all over the world to release more hot air in our negotiations. But I find it ironic that we argue about shaving a few percentage points in international commitments. Yet right here in our neighbourhood, we're releasing such copious amounts of carbon dioxide. So we need to be frank about it and to accept that we do have a problem and that in fact the whole issue of sustainable development of forests is a complex issue. Because in addition to being a source of biodiversity and of providing pulp and logging, we have to contend with the competing issues of land development, of agriculture. And it is also a supremely ironic that even as we clear our forests and even as we emit more carbon dioxide because we need more land for agriculture to feed our people. But ultimately, this is self-defeating because as climate change progresses and the sea levels rise and we get more drought and we get more floods, nature will take revenge on us and in fact, our agricultural systems will be put at risk. So that is why if we continue on this current trajectory, all of us are in trouble. I started off my speech by asking you to just remember the three points, which is that the root cause was commercial, the main victims are local, and that the solution requires collaboration, effective, decisive action on the parts of governments, NGOs, and local communities. Let me just expand a little on that. Last year, Southeast Asia experienced one of the worst episodes of haze ever. And the negative impact that that had on our economy, on our livelihoods, on our environment, and on most importantly, on the health of our people, was unprecedented. Despite this happening in June, and we would have thought we learned a lesson, but the brutal truth is that, in fact, in January and February this year, the fire burning season began even earlier, taking advantage of a drought which occurred in our region. So, so far, the signs are not promising. The haze affected Singapore, but it is important to remember that there are far more citizens in Indonesia and Malaysia who are affected far worse than my fellow citizens in Singapore. Businesses also suffered losses. Workers could not get to work sites. Even wafer fabs were affected because the air in their plants was contaminated. Airports were closed. Accidents occurred. And we all know that, in fact, the external costs of such a disaster far exceeded the short-term profits that the companies would have made. And for too many years, our region has grappled with this recurrent challenge without making much progress. We cannot and should not blame traditional slash-and-burn agriculture. Slash-and-burn agriculture has been occurring for thousands of years but we didn't have haze on this unprecedented level before. The reason we have it is because of industrial-scale deforestation at an unprecedented 
level. And this happens because the short-term gains are too compelling, whilst the companies are not liable for paying for the damage that they cause to the external environment, to the larger economy, and to the people who are most affected by their actions. So the question then, which confronts us, is can we realign the interests? Because you see, my friends, it's important for us to realize that to call a halt to development is not possible. It's not viable. Every nation, every group of people has a right to development, has a right to growth, has a right to feed his or her family. So the question is, how do we grow our economies? How do companies make profits, but in a sustainable way and in a fair way? I would leave you with three final thoughts. The first is that people have rights. They have rights to jobs, to growth, to health, and to security, and to long-term safety despite the threat of climate change. Second point is that companies have responsibilities. Companies have to make a profit. Without a profit, you don't exist. But you've got to make your profits in a way which accounts for the impact that you have on the local communities and on the environment. And the really viable, sustainable, long-term companies are those who can account for this completely. The third point is transparency. And that is where NGOs and the more responsible companies come into it. We now live in a day and age, satellite photos being available almost real time, of drones being able to ground truth data, of cheap air quality sensors, of an always on, always connected world, of the internet. We've got to turn those eyes and build a system of transparency which makes people accountable for their actions. And companies operating in such a transparent world. I'll give you an example. Unilever has committed that it will track the source of its palm oil all the way down to the plantation and therefore sends the message that it wants its sources to be derived from sustainable practices. We need to start to wake up and to operate in such a transparent world. And if we do that, I believe it is possible to develop, to make a profit, to be responsible, and to look after our people. Only and only if we do that, then can we fulfill the goal that President Susilo Bambang Yudo you know, said just now, which is that we are not making decisions just for the present, but to leave a legacy, a viable legacy for the next generation to come. So I thank you all very much for the honor of being able to address you and to speak so frankly to all of you. I look forward to your deliberations and most important, to your actions to leave a better world for the next generation. Thank you very much.